Hi, in this video I will explain which factors determine the height of a vertical jump and how to improve them. First of all, to create height in the jump, one must produce a lot of power. Power is determined by the amount of force you can produce in the shortest time possible. We can put this concept down by using the formula power equals force times velocity, or P equals F times V where force is the amount of work or energy that one is able to produce and velocity is the rate at which this force is produced. So, to generate power, not only we need to be strong, but we need to be fast too. Now, how do we generate power specifically to obtain height in a vertical jump? Power in relation to jumping is determined by these three factors, or the three R's as I like to call them. First relative strength or strength compared to body weight. Second, rate of force development, the rate at which force is produced that depends on the ability of the central nervous system to fire more motor units at once. And third, reactive strength, which is the ability of muscles and tendons to absorb elastic energy and quickly convert it to kinetic energy. Let's analyze each of these elements separately. If we look again at the formula for power, P equals F times V. We know that the first part of the equation relates to force. Force is determined by the ability to move an object that has a mass. In the human body, this ability is called strength. And because the object we are moving is our own body, the ability to move efficiently depends on one's strength compared to one's body mass. The stronger I am compared to my own mass, the more easily I'll move in space. This concept is called relative strength. So one determining outcome in the vertical jump is the amount of force relative to your body weight that you're able to put into the ground. The ground will generate a force equal to the force you exert on it, but going into the opposite direction, in this case up. How do we get to improve strength specifically for the vertical jump? If we look at the biomechanics of jumping, can distinguish three phases. In the first phase, also called eccentric phase, as the body lowers down to a half squat position, the muscles and tendons in the quads and calves extend, and in doing so they store elastic energy. In this position, the hips and the knees are flexed, and the ankles are in dorsiflexion. In the isometric phase, the body stops for an instant at the bottom of the squat, and here is where the transition between downwards and upward motion begins and the elastic energy gets converted into kinetic energy. In the last phase, or concentric phase, all elastic energy stored is transformed into kinetic energy, as muscles and tendons in the quads and calves explosively contract and the feet press powerfully against the ground and the body is propelled up in the air. You can see now hips and knee joints are extended and the ankle in plantar flexion. If we compare the motion involved on a muscle used in jumping, to another movement related to strength training, the best match is the squat. The stronger and more proficient you are in this basic movement, the more strength you'll be able to apply in the vertical jump. So, in order to have a decent jumping strength, you must be able to squat at least one and a half, or even better, twice your body weight. Let me show you an example. Athletes A who weighs 150 pounds and whose 1RM squat is 300 pounds will have a higher vertical jump than athlete B, who weighs 200 pounds and can squat 350 pounds. This is because although athlete A limit strength is less than athlete B, athlete A has a higher relative strength than athlete B. Beside the squat, the deadlift also is a key movement to develop general lower body strength and therefore jumping power. The deadlift focuses mostly on the posterior chain, that is the glutes, the hamstrings and the lower back, which are also essential for a powerful jump. To increase maximum strength, you should be aiming for a range of 3 to 5 sets of 3 to 8 reps using a load of 70% to 90% of one repetition maximum for the squat and a range of 2 to 4 sets of 3 to 6 reps using a load of 80% to 90% of 1RM for the deadlift. Earlier I've said that to optimize your jumping power, not only you must produce a lot of force, but you must also do it quickly. Unfortunately, when it comes to jumping there's a problem, because it normally takes 0.4 to 0.7 seconds to develop maximum force. 
This is because the power output in the muscles depends on how many motor units are being activated. However, most explosive movements, such as a vertical jump, happen very quickly, approximately at 0.2 seconds. You can see where the problem is. Clearly, there is not enough time to use all the force you are capable of. The rate at which your muscles are able to put out the higher amount of strength in the shortest time possible is defined as rate of force development, or RFD. RFD depends on the efficiency of the central nervous system to fire a high number of motor units instantaneously, causing muscle fibers to contract together at the same time. Although it is not possible to activate all muscle fibers required to apply peak force in the short time that a jump occur, however, it is possible through proper training to improve neuromuscular efficiency and apply a higher percentage of peak force in the 0.2 seconds time span. Let's make an example. Compare someone whose max squat is 400 pounds but who can produce 200 pounds of force in 0.2 seconds to someone else who can only squat 300 pounds but who can produce 250 pounds of force in 0.2 seconds. Who will have a better jump? The first person has a good squat strength but is only able to use 50% of this strength in a short time. The second person, on the other hand, is weaker but can produce nearly 85% of his maximum force almost instantaneously. Therefore, in this case, the second person will have a better chance of getting a higher jump. Remember though that without enough potential strength, rate of force development can become useless. The more your limit strength, also the more force you'll be able to produce in a short time. If your max squat is 100 pounds, even if you have a RFD of 100%, you won't be able to jump very high. Key to bring about an improvement of rate of force development is to try to lift weight as fast as possible. Because of the high loads involved, you won't be able to move as fast as you would in a jump, and you don't need to either. As long as you try to move explosively, you're causing the central nervous system to adapt to recruit more motor units. Therefore, weight training should be done in a way that should not hinder your ability to apply force at high speeds. In order to train your body not only to become stronger, but also to apply that strength fast, you should be aiming to perform each repetition in 3 seconds or less for the squat and 2 seconds or less for the deadlift. In general, if you are training for athletic performance and not just for limit strength, you should not be increasing the weight if it takes you more than 4 seconds to complete one rep. In this sense, Olympic lifting exercises such as the cleaning jerk and the snatch are ideal to increase rate of force development because of the explosivity of their motion and the power that is generated. But these exercises require a high level of proficiency in the technique involved, so they are not for everyone. If you don't feel confident, Better stick to more basic exercises such as squats and deadlifts. To increase rate of force development, you should be training squats within a range of 3 to 5 sets of 6 to 10 reps using a load of 50% to up to 80% of 1RM and deadlifts within a range of 2 to 4 sets of 4 to 8 repetitions using a load of 60% to 85% of 1RM. The ideal is to be able to move as closest as possible to your 1RM within a 3 seconds or 2 seconds span. For example, if your maximum deadlift is 400 pounds, you should start doing 8 reps with 240 pounds in 16 seconds or less, then 6 reps with 280 pounds in 12 seconds, 5 reps with 320 pounds in 10 seconds, and finally 4 reps with 340 pounds in 8 seconds or less. Another way to increase rate of force development is to simply jump from a still position without using bouncing or run up. Box jumps is an example of these type of exercises and one of the best. With box jumps you can use steps to add height and difficulty as you progress. Standing bro jumps or tuck jumps also fall into this category. Also a great exercise to increase power and explosivity is the kettlebell swing. The best feature of this tool is that it allows to move explosively by using the momentum created by the weight itself, activating the muscles of the posterior to a great extent, in a similar fashion that it would be activated as you jump. 
When training these exercises, you should take long rests between sets, two minutes or even longer, and not doing more than four or five sets and 10 to five repetitions per set. Remember, you're not training to improve your endurance here, but you want to get explosive instead. So allow plenty of time to rest and don't get to the point of fatigue. The last important aspect to obtain a great vertical jump is your reactive strength. This refers to the amount of force that your muscles and mostly tendons are able to absorb and subsequently release when switching from the eccentric to the concentric phase. When you jump, you would instinctively squat down a bit before bringing your body up again. During the downward phase, the stretching of your tendons cause them to store extra energy, which is then released upon changing the direction of the movement from downwards to upwards. Think of your tendons as a spring. As you pull, the spring stretches beyond its normal length. During this phase, a lot of energy is stored as elastic energy that is built up through the tension created by the lengthening of the spring. When you let go, the spring returns violently to its normal length, causing it to release energy. The same thing happens with our tendons. Every explosive movement follows this pattern. We apply it involuntarily, but it happens all the time. Think of last time you threw a ball. Did you simply extend your arm from a resting position and let the ball go? I'm sure not, and if you did it, it probably didn't make it very far. Instead, you instinctively draw your arm back, causing the tendons in your arms to stretch and store extra energy, and then quickly throw the ball as the arm reverses its direction. This extra energy allows you to throw the ball harder. By definition, all explosive movements rely on this stretch shortening cycle. Contrary to relative strength and rate of force development, reactive strength is mostly involuntary and depends on multiple factors, some of which, such as the length of your tendons and limb to trunk ratio, are genetically determined and therefore cannot be changed. This is why kangaroos can jump so high without effort because their Achilles tendons are so long and thick that they act as a huge spring, storing and releasing a great amount of elastic energy. There are other aspects, however, that are also influential to reactive strength that can indeed be improved through training. One of these factors is the ability to inhibit the stretch reflex. The stretch reflex is an involuntary muscle contraction that follows a sudden extension of the muscle. It is our body's protective mechanism and is caused by sensors in the muscles that send signals of change in length to spinal nerves, which in turn send commands back to the muscle to contract. Muscles and tendons quickly lengthen in the downward motion and then powerfully contract in the upward phase. However, here your central nervous system is working against you, preventing you to achieve your maximum potential because it prevents your muscles to store all the elastic energy that they are capable of through stretching. The good news is that we can train to inhibit proprioceptor signals and use most of our potential energy without getting injured. This can be achieved through plyometric training. Plyometric training was developed during the 1970s in the Soviet Union and consisted of two basic exercises, drop jumps and shock jumps. Drop jumps work your ability to quickly convert the elastic energy stored in the eccentric phase into the upward movement of the stretch shortening cycle. The exercise consists in dropping from an elevated surface and quickly bounce upon landing on the ground. What you need to focus here is the speed of your reaction. As soon as you feel the balls of your feet touching the ground, you must reverse the motion from downwards to upwards and jump again. This must happen as fast as you can. Imagine you were landing on burning embers. You want to make as less contact as possible with the ground. The other exercise is the shock jumps. Also called death jumps, this drill greatly increases your ability to store energy in the absorption phase. The exercise consists of jumping from an elevated point and land on a ball of your feet. The height of the elevation should be approximately 20% higher than your maximum vertical jump, and the landing should be executed as smoothly as possible, pausing for a couple of seconds upon landing. 
Both these exercises should be included in your training and you should work within a range of four to five sets of three to five reps, allowing plenty of rest between sets, up to three minutes. It might seem strange to you because you won't feel these exercises as strenuous as other type of training, but think that your body has to take up to nine times its own weight when landing from a height, and this can fatigue your muscles and tendons to a great extent. Other than these two basic exercises, there are plenty of drills that can be considered plyometric. Basically, every exercise that uses bouncing or quick reaction upon impact can be included into plyometric exercises. Some of these are low intensity like one leg hopping or skipping rope and others of medium or high intensity like sprinting or bouncing box jumps. So, to summarize, if you want to improve your jumping ability, you need to focus on these fundamental aspects. Increase maximum strength of the lower limbs by doing basic exercises such as squats and deadlifts at submaximum loads. Increase rate of force development by executing exercises in an explosive fashion and by jumping from a still position. And finally, do plyometric training to condition your body to tolerate sudden changes of muscle and tendon length so to inhibit protective mechanism and condition tendons to store more elastic energy. Mm -hmm.